You are never alone, and there is no such thing as an impossible situation with God. Look all through the Bible, and I'm telling you, those hardest situations, uh, that's when God acts, and that's when He does His miracles. And I got news for you folks, God's still in the miracle business. He is. I'm telling you, I thank God for what He is doing in the life of our church. Brother Don just was amazed of how friendly we uh, were and just, uh, you know, how receptive folks were. Uh, the crowds were great. The spirit was great. We had uh, all total 12 rededications this past week, and so we just praise God for that. Today I want to talk to you about God's divine protection. God's divine protection. Folks, we do protection for a lot of things. We buy insurance for protection. Burglar alarms for protection. But I got news for you. I know the ultimate protector, and that is God himself. All right? There's nothing that surprises God. There's nothing in life that God can't handle. I understand all this going on. Uh, the hurricanes are horrible. Uh, the war going on. And uh, even, uh, you know, I will be so glad when November 6th comes our way. <laughs> Amen. I have about decided that nobody up there tells the truth. I'm sorry. I am sorry. I'm just telling you. And what's crazy is the law has allowed them to do it. Okay? Man, I better get off this. All right. <laughs> I'm fixing to get fired up. All right. God is good. All right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Uh, we are walking through. It's that random stuff. That's why Don and I have a lot of things in common. We're, all, we're both ADD, and we get random thoughts in our heads. All right. Matthew 2, verse 13. God's divine protection. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along, number one, the escape to Egypt. The escape to Egypt. God spoke to Joseph and Mary. Number two, the massacre of babies. Oh, what a sad, sad thing. The massacre of babies and the return to Nazareth. Three times we are going to see today in our text the reason that part happened. Because folks, you have to understand that God could have kept Jesus right there close by if he chose to do that. But the reason he told him to go to Egypt was because the Old Testament prophecy said he will come out of Egypt. Okay? And listen to me. There's over 300 prophecies on Jesus in the, bio, in the Old Testament. And every one of them will come true. God's word is yes and amen. If he said it, we are going to take it to the bank and we are going to believe it by faith. You know, in our text today, we can see that God was working in the lives of Joseph and Mary in a special way. After experiencing the birth of baby Jesus, the perfect son of God, and meeting the wise men who brought wonderful gifts, it was time to begin raising Jesus. Can you imagine those two? I mean, there was every indication that they might have been 14 or 15 years old, and they were poor. And they had the responsibility of raising Jesus. That is amazing. The young couple were on top of the world and extremely excited about their new beginning as parents. Since the beginning of time, Satan seems to do his best to ruin good times and make God's children uncomfortable with big challenges that test, that test our faith. Folks, Satan is behind every evil in this world. Thankfully, God always has a plan for his chosen people. What Satan meant for bad, God's protection and guidance made the way for Joseph, Mary, and Jesus to be saved. Praise God, his power is greater than any force of evil in the world today. Let's look at this incredible story in God's holy word, God's divine protection. Matthew 2, verse 13, now when they had departed, okay, it, the Bible says, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child 
to destroy him. I find the first amazing thing about this is an angel of the Lord spoke to him. And in the Old Testament times, God himself spoke to the prophets at times. You know, from the burning bush, God called Moses. And you can see, you know, where, where God manifests himself to give them an assignment. And then the other thing you have to see is they, they use dreams a lot, of, a lot of times too. And this was what was going on. Matter of fact, even in the New Testament, uh, God uh, and Jesus spoke from heaven and, and Saul was on his road to Damascus and they asked him the question, why are you against me? And Paul heard the audible voice. Now folks, I've never heard God in an audible voice, but I believe if he wanted to, he can and would. But you know what God does nowadays? He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And some of the reasons we miss God is because we are not listening to the Holy Spirit. Man wants to poll everybody. What do you think? Well, what do you think? Well, what do you think? And somebody will ask me, and I already know, I already know they've asked nine persons before me. Why didn't you ask me first? <laughs> I'm joking, okay? But I'm simply saying, man can make mistakes. Another man cannot tell you, or a woman tell you, God's will for your life. So let's get it direct from God through the Holy Spirit. And that is so important. Hold your finger there and go to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel 3, let me give you an Old Testament uh, example of this. And we know Samuel was, a, a pro was going to be a prof prophet. Uh, Hannah could not have children in, uh, you know, through the early part, and, and she uh, would just beg God for a child, and she made a pact with God. If you give me this child, I'll give him back to you. And so pick up in chapter 3, and the Lord had called Samuel once. The Lord had called Samuel twice, but he was young and did not understand that it was God talking to him. So pick up in verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. That, you know, that makes me encouraged, <laughs> all right? Because sometimes God just says, hey, knucklehead, I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned or worried or fretting over something. And many times, God, he did it to me this week. God says, chill out. I got this. You don't have to handle everything in your life. But he's speaking to Samuel, young, young. And the Lord called him again the third time. So he arose and went uh, to Eli, and he was the priest there. And he said, here I am for you, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. I'm amazed at the people that will pray and pray and pray and not get the answer. Could it possibly be that you're not listening? Could it possibly be you don't like the answer that God gives you? Folks, God has the answer. There is a perfect will of God for you in your life. If you will get in the Word, if you will get on your knees, if you will pray to God in faith, and then listen, he has the answer. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called his other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. Oh folks, there needs to be times in our lives where we don't make a poll and we don't Asked everyone's opinion. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? But I'm telling you, and, and I, I've gotten good advice from Christians, but every once in a while, you can get bad advice from Christians. How do you know the Word of God? How do you know the Spirit of God? So folks, the Spirit talked to them, and Joseph, and he told him, man, you got to get out of here. Isn't it amazing where he sent them? Sent them to Egypt. Those were foes of Israel. 
Think of the Old Testament. I mean, th this wasn't a safe place. The people, Pharaoh and all of them, all that was going on there. But folks, God, I'm not saying it's abnormal, but I'm saying God does things other people wouldn't do. And why? Why, why would it be dangerous in Egypt if God sent them? It wouldn't be. But just that alone made me, just my ears just perked up when I said, Egypt, why that? And stay there until I bring the word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Look at verse 14, and when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and depart from Egypt. Why do you go at night? You don't want to be seen. Why do you want to go at night? Because people don't know the direction that you are going. So God told him not only where to go, but he told him when to go. Folks, I am telling you, God speaks to us every, every day. And you know what the devil's plan is? To keep you so busy that you can't hear from God. He wants you watching the TV. He wants you on your, uh, you know, your laptops. He wants earbuds in your ears 24-7, all right? And while that alone is not a problem, but folks, we have to spend time to God, with God to know the will of God, and he will speak to us. And there was, uh, and, and went by night and departed Egypt, and there was, and was there unto the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. And folks, this is the first of the three prophets, uh, prophecies here. And he is quoting Hosea 11, verse 1. And we know the story of Hosea and Gomer. How Gomer uh, was basically a, a prostitute. And how Hosea uh, was his wife and he had forgiven her. And you think about it in the Old Testament. How many times can you read in the Old Testament where Israel started looking at false gods, that Israel started uh, falling away from God, that Israel was looking at what the world had to offer, and God would discipline Israel, and, and part of the Babylonian captivity is that going on. So this is nothing new, but to, to uh, say this prophecy had to be fulfilled, I am telling you, this is what God told them to do. God, I'm telling you folks, I don't care where you're at. I don't care the location. God is there. Psalm 139 said, if I ascend to the heavens, God is there. If I go up on a mountain, God is there. If I descend into the middle of the earth, God is there. When I'm sleeping at night, God is there. When I'm in my car, God is there. Folks, I thank God for his divine protection. So we see the escape to Egypt. And really, just one last thing. Folks, it's so important that we be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We have to listen. We have to know His voice. We have to have the assurance that God told me to do this. Even when I first came to Arkansas, I knew one family in Arkansas, and that was Bob and Jan Shelton. Not one. Not one. But yet God kept telling me, go, go, and go. My parents helped me move my stuff here uh, when, when I came here. And the, the old attendance board was back there. And my dad looked at that attendance board. He said, are you sure you want to go here? Gospel truth, folks. God told me to go. God told me. And folks, he will not let you down if we will listen to God. Number two, the massacre of babies. Then Herod, when he saw that uh, he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. Now there's anger, and there's exceedingly anger. Let me throw words out here. Rage. Hate. All right? Just out of his mind, crazy. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years old under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Folks, I am telling you, the killing of babies. And, and again, I read one commentary that said, uh, you know, with how many people were there and just the estimates in history 
that were going on. It might have only been 24 uh, to 30 kids, but one child is too much. Folks, I am telling you, we have to stand for the unborn, folks. Life begins at conception. We need to honor God's Word. God's Word. And even in, in sensitive cases, folks, there's adoption. The Bible says, thou shall not kill. In America, we have been doing this way too long. And folks, I hope you understand that we need to stand for the unborn. He was messed up. Herod was in a rage. All right, he wanted to be the king, uh, you know, of the Jews, and he was that by name only. The king of the Jews is our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. Yes, amen. And it says, and then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah to the prophet, saying, a voice was heard in uh, Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Oh, folks, I could not imagine what it was like when that started. My heart would be jerked out of my chest. I would be on my knees praying for what was going on. We as a church, I hope, would be there for them, for them, because Satan was, I'm telling you, at his evil way. And, and here, the expression in Jeremiah says, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Oh, folks, I am telling you, Rama uh, was just uh, five miles north of Jerusalem. But when all this was going on around Bethlehem, folks, I am telling you, there had to be a holy hush there. There had to be this, this hurt and this pain and this aching going on. And when it mentions uh, yeah, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, it describes what was going on. Uh, you know, and, and then it, uh, it mentions Rachel here. And we remember Rachel uh, in Genesis chapter 30. She could not have children. And she begged God, she begged God, if you would just give me children. And we know that Jacob was her husband, and we know what happened there. God blessed them uh, with 12 children. And what he's saying is, as probably she was praying before she got pregnant, she was crying out and pouring her heart out, begging God for a child. And the Bible says, uh, God blessed her with a child. Jeremiah 31, this is where the prophecy is. Jeremiah 31, verse 15. And, the Lord, and says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. The very, I'm quotation there, uh, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And it probably has also uh, another thing to the Babylonian captivity and all that was going on there. But I want you to notice verse 16 and 17. Thus saith the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord. See, we're talking about the past in the Old Testament. But folks, I am telling you, you we sang it today, there will be a day, folks. There will be a day, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in the future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. And folks, I am telling you, when it's all said and done, we studied Revelation, Jesus is coming again. I believe the rapture of the church is the next thing on God's prophetic calendar. I believe the, the seven years of tribulation and all that's going on there, and the world is just a mess. It is a wreck, and then uh, God will come, the second coming. And I am telling you, when Jesus comes, He's going to make everything right. He is going to destroy the armies. He is going to just take over. The millennial period will come in, 
And I'm telling you, you talk about a thing of hope. You talk a thing about blessedness. All that time, that thousand-year reign will be with our Lord and Savior. So why would he mention this? Because, folks, everyone needs hope in their life. I couldn't tell you how many people that I talked to in a week's time that seem to have no hope. Folks, I'm telling you, there's always hope with God. There's always, you know, and I've heard everything, a chance or luck. And folks, I don't believe in any of that. I believe in God. He, the Bible tells us he ordains the steps of the righteous. He's protecting you. He's watching over you. He's going to take care of you. I don't care what happens in your life. God is there, and I am telling you, I can't wait for the day when he comes again. So we see this first prophecy and the second prophecy Matthew wrote in this part. Now look at the third prophecy, the return to Nazareth. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to, jo in, to Joseph in Egypt. So he sends an angel again to talk to Joseph, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Herod, Herod was dead. Herod was dead. And, and again, I'm telling you, probably one of the most wicked, one of the most vile rulers of any land ever. Verse 21, and then he arose, and he took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. You have to understand, that, you know, the first track was, it was about 75 miles to the border, border of Egypt. And then to be safe, he probably went at least 50 or more miles in there. So this is not an easy track, especially getting there. A young mother, a young, young baby, and the traveling in those days, it, you know, it was donkey or it was walking or horses. And then the travel back, but again, you think about the, the magi, the wise men, the gifts they gave to him, I believe, supported that track. Folks, God's ahead of us all the time. We fall behind God sometimes because we don't listen because we are not listening for the perfect will of God. Now look at verse 22. But when he heard that Ar Archelaus was reigning over Judah, and that was Herod's son, and by the way, he wasn't much better than Herod, okay? And, and we have to understand that, folks. I talk to people that have addictions, and they say, my mother was an addict, and my father was an addict. And what I always tell them you can break the chain. God can break the chain. You don't have to be an addict. I thank God for all the whatever step programs they are. But the bottom line is, you're not going to do it without God. God is here for you. And it says, instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. So Joseph was just thinking as he got closer, all right, to, you know, uh, Bethlehem and in Jerusalem, he decided, man, I'm, I'm hearing about this son, and I'm hearing about all this, and this does not seem safe. And it says, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside to the region of Galilee, the region of Galilee. And that was where uh, if you look historically where Mary and Joseph was from, isn't it neat that they got to go back home? Isn't it neat that they got to go back around family? All right? And that's where, uh, you know, they raised Jesus for 30 years. In verse 23, and he came and dwelled in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And we know that Nazareth was 55 five miles north of Jerusalem. And so it was kind of a, you know, a distance away, but it wasn't a thriving town. 
Uh, there was a Roman army there and, you know, uh, different soldiers and people like that. But if you remember Nathaniel when they told him, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know talk, talking about Jesus, remember what Nathaniel said? He's from Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, I got news for you. The best thing in your life came out of Nazareth. It is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And folks, another thing, don't judge a person by their appearance. Okay? In God's book, everyone's important. In God's book, the color of the skin doesn't matter. In God's book, everyone is a prospect. In God's book, everyone needs Jesus Christ. I don't care what their hair looks like. I don't care. You know, you, you, we just do that. We're, we are, folks. Everybody needs Christ. And he shall be called uh, Nazareth. And here we see that was their home. And it was a fulfillment of two more prophecies that I want to throw in there. Isaiah 7. Go with me, if you would, to Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call, call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means God with us. Oh, folks, God is always with us. Jesus is with us. God sent his son Jesus, to die on the cross for your sins. Then Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7. Oh, let's see. No, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Sorry about that. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called, folks, these are names for Jesus. Wonderful. Counselor. Hey, you know the best counselor in the world? It's not somebody that sits behind a desk. Jesus Christ or God in the Word of God. Every problem that you have in life, every question that you have in life can be answered in the Word of God. You see, sometimes men miss things up. Sometimes man misinterprets Scripture. So we have to be careful. But Jesus is the best counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over His kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even, hey, you like that word? Forever. Amen. Folks, heaven is forever, forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Go with me to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, thus the Lord says, Who created you, O Jacob? And he formed you, O Israel. I love this word. Fear not. 365 times in the Word of God says, fear not. Folks, we don't have anything to fear. Anything. And I hear it all the time. Well, what about or what ifs? Folks, you can't live on what ifs. I read a stat once said not 70% of the things you worry about never happen. You know what you did? You just wasted your time worrying about it. Worrying's kind of like a rocking chair. You know why? There's a lot of movement, but you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Quit worrying and start praying. Quit worrying and start believing. Quit worrying and seek the face of God. Fear not, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. Hey, I can say when I was a kid, my daddy can beat your daddy up. <laughs> Nobody's beating up my heavenly father, folks. Nothing. 
nothing. He's all powerful. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. He's proven that in Scripture. He's given you examples of that in Scripture. Nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and I love this, your Savior. Boy, sometimes, sometimes in the athletic world, I'll be watching a game and somebody will get traded. And the announcer will say something like this, he is going to be their savior. And man, my heart just says, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. That better be a little S, and you better not be using that for God. All right? God, Jesus is capital S, which means deity, the one and only Savior. There's no other name given unto heaven where you're going to be saved except Jesus Christ the Lord. And then Psalm 18, and I close with this. Psalm 18. Let me get there. Psalm 18. The Bible says, verse 1, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. Notice these words, rock, and my fortress, rocks, strong, fortresses, that's protection, my deliverer, he can do it, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. There's the key. You got to trust. You got to trust in his timing. Many people quit praying for things And that answer prayer might have been right around the corner. Keep trusting God. My shield, we know what those are for. The horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. Oh, church, I want you to know there's no situation in your life that God can't handle. God cares. He cares for you. He cares for your family. He cares for people around you. He wants all to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. You've been given a choice. You've give, given a choice. And folks, I pray to God that you will quit trying to fix everything. That's why so many people worry and They have health issues, and they have all these things going on because we, as parents, and especially as grandparents, try to fix everything. Folks, that's not our job. Our job is to be an example to the younger ones. Our job is to pray for the young ones. Our job is to show them in the Word of God. One thing I always never understood, what my father said, He said, when I asked him, why? Why do I have to do that? Because I said so. He said that a thousand times. And it's a a true answer. When dad talked, it happened. But you know what you need to say? Why do I have to do this? Because God says so. Folks, he is our Savior. Father, thank you for this day. And But I know with all my heart, there are people here that are just hurting. God, there's broken marriages. God, there's terminal cancer. There's people that have lost their jobs. There are people that right now, they're just down. And God, I know you can help all of us. God, I pray that we would just turn things over to you. God, you can fix anything, but it takes commitment on our part. God, I pray that we would be praying, church, that we would be a committed church. God, I pray that when we see someone crying, that we would just stop and say, man, can I pray for you? God, there's so many people hurting. And God, I pray that we would be that light in a dark world. 
I pray that we would be that hope in a hopeless world. So God, I pray you use us. God, if there's one here that needs to be saved today, God, I pray they would be saved. And God, I pray if there's a Christian who is struggling, that they would just give that situation to God. God can save. God can fix it. But God, we just have to depend on you. So God, we love you. We praise you and we give you this time that we have. Maybe others need to come for baptism or even join our church. God, I pray that you would move in and amongst us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?